This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hey there, cat lovers. Welcome to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat. I'm your host, Dr. Katherine Prim, and I'm a small animal veterinarian, and obviously, I'm a crazy cat lover. Today, I have with me Dr. Art Markman. Dr. Markman is a regular contributor to the show, and today we're going to delve into something that I think we all need to be aware of, and that is the issue of animal hoarding. So we're going to take a quick break and be right back with Dr. Markman to learn a lot of neat stuff. We'll be right back. Kitty Poo Club reinvented the litter box. No more scrubbing that stinky plastic tray. Or worrying, oh my God, do my guests smell that? No cleaning, no scrubbing, no more stink. You are going to love it. Your cats are going to love it. Go to kittypooclub.com and when you order... Save 30% on your first auto ship. Visit kittypooclub.com, use code MEOW30 at checkout, and join the club, the Kitty Poo Club. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat on Pet Life Radio. As I said, I have Dr. Art Markman with me today. Hi, Dr. Markman. Oh, hey. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Now, for all of my listeners, can you tell a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. I am a, uh, a cognitive psychologist by training, which means I study the way people think. And uh, I spend a lot of time communicating to, uh, to broader audiences about how thinking works, right? So, I, so not, not only have I done studies that that get read by 30 of my closest colleagues, but I like to bring that out to everybody. I am a professor here at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, also a, an administrator here, and uh, just love digging into the psychology of everyday life. Well, and you're also an animal lover, so Absolutely. that's how you ended up here. That's so right. I like your podcast. You're a fellow podcaster. So um, when I saw some headlines about animal hoarding, there there were some local issues here where all the veterinarians had to kind of join together to place some animals that had been in an animal hoarding situation. I thought, you know what? I think that this is something that my listeners could benefit from learning about. So can you tell us a little bit what is animal hoarding? So, I mean, obviously, the the symptom of animal hoarding is that you have someone who has taken on responsibility for far more animals than they can handle. But that's a symptom of of really something else that's going on. And um, and I think a lot of what's going on with animal hoarding is it's it's related to a variety of obsessive compulsive disorders. You know, we've all seen probably movies and things like that about people who have obsessive compulsive disorders. And, and those are generally speaking characterized by some kind of repeated behavior. And sometimes that repeated behavior is something like washing your hands, but it could be uh, collecting animals and taking care of them. At root, those disorders are a way of trying to keep anxiety at bay. So you do things to try to control an environment in order to feel less anxious about things. And I think for hoarders in general and animal hoarders in particular, there is a desire to be surrounded by familiar things. With many animal hoarders, there's also a desire to try to fix what is perceived as a problem where the animals are not being taken care of in appropriate ways and to create an environment that feels initially like it's full of love because one of the reasons we all get pets is is the unconditional love that they show us and so all of those things are attempts to try to keep a persistent anxiety at bay so basically it's someone who sees the issue of an animal that's homeless or needs to be rescued but it just kind of gets out of control is that what i'm understanding 
They're seeing animals who need help. They are. And, and these are generally folks who are dealing with other sources of anxiety in their lives as well. So the anxiety may not stem just from uh, a desire to care for animals. This may be individuals who are experiencing anxiety in some other way. And then on top of that, they see the the caring for animals as a way of seizing control over something and using that as a way of trying to minimize that anxiety. So I have lots of clients that have a lot of pets, a lot of cats, in <laughs> fact. So how do we know when the behavior has crossed over into something that is destructive or pathologic? Yeah. So I think there's sort of two answers to that question. One of which is just, is somebody creating an environment that is conducive to good care for the animals? So part of the problem with animal hoarding is that you have, you know, you have individuals with so many animals that they actually can't keep them well. They, they, they don't have the space to allow the animals enough space for each other. They can't keep the environment clean. They can't keep the animals cared for. And that's the symptom piece of it, right? So, you know, if, if somebody had 30 acres of land and then a lot of animals and, you know, a staff of people, then having a lot of animals isn't a problem. But if you've got an 800 square foot house, then having that same number of animals could be really problematic at the level of being able to take care of them. Then there's the symptom piece, the sort of underlying psychology of it, which is if you are driven to continue to collect more animals because you are, uh, you, you know, you're seeing animals that are out there and, and you're thinking, I need to take care of these, I must have the, these animals, then, then that's the place where you're really running into something that's more pathological because, because you're not going to stop that behavior. There isn't a number of animals where where that number is is enough. You're constantly going to be saying, but I, I could take another one. And look, there's an animal that needs help. I should take that on as well. So I know that it is difficult to put parameters on something like this, but, but what is the typical, I would say, a type of person? Or it, do we know whether or not it tends to be male or female? I mean, are there any parameters that might alert an onlooker that this was going on? Yeah, it's a, a good question. I mean, I you know, I think obsessive compulsive disorders happen to men and women, uh, young and old, but they tend to manifest themselves somewhat differently. So on average, we see more uh, women as animal hoarders than men. That doesn't mean there are no men, but it skews a little bit more towards women in part because culturally, you know, women are, are uh, have take on a disproportionate share of caretaking responsibilities. And so a way of assuaging anxiety about caretaking is to have animals that you are taking care of. And so, and so that's one of the reasons why it may manifest that way for women. But I think, you know, when you're looking at people, I think one of the things you want to ask is, you know, is the person's life manageable given the pets that they have? I mean, every pet owner knows that having even one animal at home requires a certain level of responsibility of, I have a dog and, you know, my dog is, is unfortunately suffering from cancer right now. And, and so taking care of him and, you know, putting him in, in his big dog stroller and making sure he gets out so he can sniff the, the neighborhood is, is a daily thing that we do to make sure that he's taken care of. That responsibility is, is time consuming. At the point where you have enough animals that you can't actually put in the right amount of time to do the things that are required to take care of those animals, both on a daily basis and the more routine maintenance kinds of, of things that we have to do of taking our, our animals to the vet and making sure that they're getting their medications and things like that. I mean, that's the point at which you're really seeing somebody slip over that edge. And when you look at, at that environment, you know, are they able to keep the environment clean? Are they able to, to create an environment in which their full-time life job is not devoted to taking care of animals? I mean, that's those are some of the things you're looking for. So I think I probably have listeners that are looking at this situation from the outside in and some that are looking maybe from the, the inside out. So how do you know in yourself or in others when 
the animals and the situation has become something that's maybe a human health risk or, I mean, how do you identify when you might need help? Yeah. So let's take it from the inside first. Anyone who is involved with animals, particularly folks who who work at shelters or, you know, volunteer regularly or, or are at least, you know, paying attention to animal adoption, you know, all of us have experienced the desire to want to take on every single animal we see. You know, you see the pictures of, of a new dog at the shelter and you think, oh, that, I feel so bad for that animal and I, I, want, I want to help. When you're able to then resist that desire and realize, you know what, I'd love to do this, but, but I really, I can't take that. I can't take that additional responsibility on. Then you're human, right? You're experiencing the normal human emotion of the desire to help along with the, the recognition that your resources are limited and, you know, maybe you'll volunteer or give a donation, but, but you're not necessarily going to take that animal home. I think at the point where you can't resist that urge ever, you know, where you are you know, you see an animal that's in need and you just think, well, I have to do this despite all of the other caretaking responsibilities I've already taken on. I've, I've got to take on this one as well. That's the point at which I think from the inside, you've got to begin to think, you know what, maybe I need a little bit of help from someone else to help me understand why I'm doing this. And then also to give me some skills at not saying yes to the things that I know I shouldn't say yes to. And I think that when you see this happening from the outside, when you have a, a someone in your life, could be a loved one, could be a friend, who really, you know, can't say no to these things. I mean, I think that's the point at which, you know, you may recognize that there's a problem. And as difficult as it is, I think it's important to just sit down and say, hey, you know, I'm a little bit worried that you're taking on more than you can handle here and that it's not going to be good for you. It's not going to be good for the the animals and really, you know, suggest that they find someone that they can talk to, to, to help them sort through that. So typically in a typical case like this, is there some sort of trigger that kind of takes someone that is a little bit anxious really over the edge or does it just sort of happen? <laughs> you know, what happens is that, you know, when you have somebody who's experiencing a certain amount of anxiety and they're looking for, for something to relieve that anxiety, the healthiest way to relieve anxiety is actually to face that anxiety head on right? That uh, if you look at a lot of the cognitive behavioral therapies for different kinds of anxieties, what you end up doing sometimes initially with the help of medication and eventually without it is to learn to face those anxieties, to recognize that they are not signals of danger and gradually see those those anxieties diminish. That's kind of the, the therapeutic angle that's taken on that. The way that a lot of these obsessive compulsive kinds of behaviors, including hoarding, come about is that they are a variant of what's sometimes called a safety behavior. So you have an anxiety and you want to relieve that anxiety. And so what you do is you do some other thing that makes you feel a little bit better in the moment. So you're worried about the germs that are outside. And so you wash your hands. It makes you feel a little bit better than you go outside. And now what happens is you've got to wash your hands frequently, maybe so frequently that it really becomes a compulsive behavior. And you're doing it because it's this behavior that's keeping the anxiety at bay. With animals, what's happening is, you know, you've got this anxiety and now, you know, you adopt a cat and uh, makes you feel a little bit better you know, having that cat around. And then as a result of that, you adopt another one, you know, that makes you feel a little bit better. And then, you know, but your anxiety builds back up again. So you adopt another one. And so you're using this acquisition of animals as a, uh, as a safety behavior rather than facing the anxiety. And that's really the, the growth of these kinds of, of syndromes. So although it's a good thing to rescue pets and to help animals and to care, it kind of becomes a pathology then you're saying if yeah. you just keep doing it for a momentary relief and right. then you can't meet the needs of the animals. So we need to take a quick break. So we'll be right back. Kitty Poo Club reinvented the litter box. No more scrubbing that stinky plastic tray or worrying. Oh my God, do my guests smell that? Kitty Poo Club has solved the stink. And now the worst part of cat ownership is hassle-free. No cleaning, no scrubbing, no more stink. And the best thing is you don't have to buy some oversized contraption that will break down. 
Kitty Poo Club litter boxes are manufactured to make your life easier. You have one cat? Easy peasy. A small mountain lion? No problem. You are going to love it. Your cats are going to love it. Believe me, there are good reasons why we sold over 3 million boxes. Go to kittypooclub.com, read the amazing reviews, and when you order, save 30% on your first auto ship. Visit kittypooclub.com, use code MEOW30 at checkout, and join the club, the Kitty Poo Club. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat on Pet Life Radio. Today I have with me Dr. Art Markman. So what if there is someone listening and they're like, oh my gosh, Dr. Markman is talking about me. I think I'm in this situation. What do those people do? Yeah, I think there's two things to do. The first, of course, is to take a look at your life at this moment and ask, am I able to manage the, the animals I have right now? And if not, I think the first call that you need to make is to a local animal rescue organization to get some help just rehoming the animals, some of the animals that you've taken on to make sure that you have a manageable number of animals uh, in your own home and that the rest of the animals are being taken care of well, right? So let's start by making sure that the, those animals are, are being effectively taken care of. The second thing then is to reach out to the mental health community in your community and find a, a therapist, a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist who specializes in anxiety disorders and, and reach out and, you know, and just talk, you know, start that process of getting some, some help. I think, you know, we all have to recognize that mental health is health and that if your arm hurt to the point where you couldn't move your arm, you'd go to the doctor. If you have anxiety to the point where the only way to cope with that is to engage in an unhealthy behavior, like adopting large numbers of animals, then that's like having an arm that doesn't work and reaching out to the medical community to start that process of getting help is incredibly important. And it's a, it's a long road and it's a difficult road to address anxiety, but it's a, it's a manageable road. Uh, with with the right help and and one that where your life can be significantly better and where you can develop a healthier relationship with the pets that you do have. Yes, I agree. I think our pets add so much to our lives. But if you or someone you know is in a situation where the animals can't be kept clean, can't receive veterinary care that they need, and something that I think people don't realize about having a large number of animals, this is my veterinary soapbox, large number of animals in a small environment, there are social issues among those animals, and that is not meeting their mental needs. Okay. So I want my listeners to prioritize the mental needs of themselves and the people that they love, but also think about even if you're able to feed them all, and even if you're able to keep them fairly clean, they still may not be getting their mental needs met. So it's kind of a soul searching thing, I think. Don't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I mean, many of the pets that we keep, particularly dogs and cats are social animals you know, a very crowded environment becomes a very stressful environment. And so you're absolutely right. It goes beyond just care and feeding. It, it's also creating a stress-free environment for the animals. And if there's, if there's just too many animals in the area, then they are all going to be stressed out in ways that are not good for the animals. And by the way, not good for the owner either, because particularly if you are engaging in this animal hoarding to relieve anxiety, and then the animals around you are anxious, that actually feeds on itself in negative ways. I really want everyone listening to know that there is help. There are things that you can do to get to a better place. So, you know, maybe ask yourself about where you are right now. And I think that you alluded to the safety behavior. I want to delve into that a little bit more because I think even for our animals, and that's my area of expertise, being safe and having anxiety, that's a protective normal behavior. And it's only when it gets beyond maladaptive is what we say in veterinary medicine. And I think that that's what you're saying as well, that human beings also have anxiety, but it becomes maladaptive. Is that what I'm understanding? 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. You know, anxiety is a natural human emotion. It's it's and it's an important one when there's a potential threat in my world, a potential calamity, a potential just even a something I have to you know something that could go wrong at work. It is natural to feel some anxiety, and that's that's good because I, because a little bit of anxiety makes you vigilant to things that could go wrong. It it can be motivating to make you work hard so that a, a bad thing doesn't happen. You know, I, I think a, a life that had no anxiety in it at all wouldn't be right because you wouldn't be facing things that go wrong in your life. the The problem with 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 anxiety is when when it's pervasive, when every day is filled with dread and fear of things that can go wrong, many of which are out of your control, that kind of persistent anxiety is the problem. And so, you know, finding ways to get away from potential threats is good when, when you know, you're, you're just occasionally experiencing some stress and anxiety and you focus on ways to fix that. When you have this persistent anxiety that's that's all consuming and and just a, a constant part of your life, now there isn't really a single behavior you can perform to get rid of that anxiety, and that's where you end up with these safety behaviors, where what you're doing is engaging in something that makes you feel a little bit better in the moment, but isn't really addressing the underlying source of the anxiety. Yes, I think it's important to note that there is no health care, including mental health care, that has an easy button. Right. You know, I <laughs> I talk about it in my exam room. They're like, oh, come on, my dog has diabetes. Can't you just wave a wand? And, I mean, you know, that kind yep. of thing. There is no easy button. You have to put in the work. But, yeah, your brain is like your liver or your arm. And so definitely seek help, but feel hopeful. That's and right. loving animals is not a bad thing. Right. It just becomes a bad thing when it's maladaptive. So I am so thrilled that you are willing to come and talk to me about it today. Are there any specific resources that you can think of that my listeners might be able to read or, or watch if they think that they have this issue or they have a family member or loved one that has an issue like this? There are a lot of really nice articles, for example, on the Psychology Today website that deal with the causes and cures for obsessive compulsive disorders. And I think reading about that can be really helpful to understand that it is, it is more common than you might think for people to have this kind of anxiety uh, and, and to find ways to address it. And so, you know, I think, I think a lot of times part of the problem is when you're feeling anxiety and, and you're doing things that you know you probably shouldn't, you feel ashamed about that. And, and shame is an emotion that that is really often unhelpful because it causes you to hide things from others. And, and actually it's bringing them to light and getting help from, from your, uh, your, your family, your friends that gives you that road to recovery. So I, I think, you know, check out the, just, you know, if you, if you go to that psychology today website, search on obsessive compulsive disorders, you will find a, a plethora of really good articles that are accessible you don't need to be a professional psychologist to understand them. And uh, and they'll give you a background that'll help you to, to better understand what's going on. And loving animals is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but no, sometimes, I mean, you sometimes you have to put the needs of the animal first. And I think when you have a situation where there are so many animals, those needs aren't being met. And that's important, too. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And you know, we want to create a manageable environment for ourselves, for the animals that we love so much. And look, I totally understand how hard it is to see the number of animals that are in shelters and, and just wish that you could help every single one of them. And if you have the time to be able to volunteer at a shelter and, and take care of the cats or, or walk the dogs, you know, that's, that's a wonderful thing. If you, if you can, you know, donate a couple of bucks a month even to uh, to a local animal shelter to make sure that those animals are being taken care of. Those are those are all ways to help without taking on a level of responsibility that you just can't handle. That is an excellent place to end up. And on, by the way, I'm very sorry that your dog is dealing with cancer. Know that you are not alone because I certainly deal with that on a daily basis. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I hope that we were able to help at least one person out there. Uh, thanks so much for having me on again. It was, it was always a pleasure to talk to you. And, and I'm glad we could talk about this issue, even though it's a difficult one.
Agreed. Well, for anyone that wants to listen to Dr. Markman and all the things that he talks about, his podcast is called Two Guys on Your Head. It is fascinating, and I encourage all of you to look it up. And I just want to thank Dr. Markman for being here always. I can always count on him. He'll give me amazing, insightful comments anytime I need or want them. And also Mark Winter, my amazing producer, and my loyal listeners who continue to support Nine Lives with Dr. Cat. All of you go out and have a perfect day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. 